you brought up Buffett, and there's a quote in one of your uh, letters where you talk about not being good at art, but you share the story how Buffett sees his work as a as a painting, as his Sistine Chapel, and that's how you think of your work. Can you talk about that? That visual of you know a collection of stocks being your piece of art in your mind. Yeah. So. I, I have a niece who's in her teens and she's an amazing artist. She really is. Like she paints and draws things that I could never do. I don't have that gene. I can remember being in grade eight and we had this art class and people around me were doing portraits and the, the Scott right beside me painted this amazing picture of waves in, in uh, acrylic. And I can still remember my, my painting was this alligator with a golf ball in its mouth. It was a, I was a golf nut. It looked like a child did it. It was so, it was so bad. <laughs> That's not my talent. And so when I, when I read uh -huh. about Buffett being in the Sistine Chapel, he talks about his portfolio or his painting and he's lying on his back and he's painting. And then someone else says, you know, put a little more red in it. And he says, goodbye. It's his painting. So, you know, I, I can paint with, I can't paint with my hands, but I can paint with my mind. And, and so all, all of my life experience and judgment and learning, I can create a portfolio of my best ideas. And, and I'm, you know, my job is to wake up every day and continue to learn and to have new insights to try and make it better. And it's never finished, right? You can always make it better. You, you wake up and you see the world, you see something different and you say, Oh, you know, I've changed my mind on that. Um, so it, for for a math geek, that's my version of painting. I, I read Walter Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo used to paint, he used to paint some of his masterpieces over decades. Welcome to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest topic of all, money. How to make it, save it, keep it. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question, what it means to live a rich life beyond money. My guests share their practices, principles, and evergreen wisdom. I'm your host, Bogomil Baranowski, author, TEDx speaker, and investment advisor to wealth creators with patient capital and an infinite investment horizon. I work with families and individuals who aspire to grow wealth over a lifetime and generations through disciplined, thoughtful investments in durable, quality businesses while giving money meaning. Join me on this quest to unearth and share the wisdom of the ages. Let me share with you the podcast program disclosure statement. Blue Infinitas Capital LLC is a registered investment advisor and the opinions expressed by the firm's employees and podcast guests on the show are their own and do not reflect the opinions of Blue Infinitas Capital. All the statements and opinions expressed are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice. The information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. The information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for any individual. Listeners are encouraged to seek advice from a qualified tax, legal, or investment advisor to determine whether any information presented may be suitable for their specific situation. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. None of what you're about to hear is investment advice. My guest today is Michael McCloskey who founded and manages Green's Keeper, a value investing firm in Canada. Michael and I met at Guy Spears Value X conference. We snowshoed together in the Swiss Alps at some point and shared many conversations both in Switzerland and at Buffett's Berkshire meeting in Omaha. Today we talk about thoughtful, disciplined stock picking and the passion for a particular kind of investing and lessons from running an investment firm. Hi Michael, how are you? So nice to see you again. I'm well, Bogomil. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. I'm very excited to have you on the show. You and Thank I you. connected over ValueX, Guy Spears ValueX. You were kind enough to invite me onto a snowshoeing expedition outside of yes. Foster's. 
and I sent you a million questions, what it's all about and how I should dress for it. And you're much more experienced in that field than I was. Yeah, it's not, it's an annual tradition now. One of Guy's uh, former colleagues used to run it, and then she she left um, the organization. So I just I took it over, and so now it's a, a tradition that I take new people snowshoeing, and for people that don't ski, it's a lot of fun. It's a good way to chat too as you're walking, right? It's a little easier than than when you're skiing. So yeah, yeah, I enjoyed meeting you there, and I'm looking forward to this. That's a beautiful setting, and we're talking in the middle of the summer, so it's it's. Nice to reminisce about those cold winter days. I have so many questions about ValueX. We'll come back to it and the importance of community, and we'll talk more about it. But I, I want to start with the early days, if you allow me. And I'm very curious about your childhood upbringing and how you think that time shaped you and most of all inspired this particular curiosity in, in the world of investing. Okay, so I grew up with in Canada primarily I have a brother and a sister I'm the oldest of the three how would I describe my upbringing very loving family very close with my family still am to this day uh, but but I'd say that the the one thing that kind of shaped me uh, who I am today was we moved around a lot my mom and dad in their generation got married early when they were 19 they had me when they were 21 years old so very young family and my dad was in business and worked for a lot of multinational companies like Nabisco and Christie. And so we had the opportunity to move where the jobs were. When you work for a big multinational, at least in those days, if you were good, and my, I think my dad was really good at what he did at management, that he just moved all over the place. We moved to Winnipeg and, and Halifax. We even lived in the Philippines at one point in time. And so by the time I was nine, when we moved back to Canada, I think I had probably lived in about 10 or 11 houses. Like we moved every year. Uh, and so I talked to my sister about it recently. And, and she said that for her and my brother, who were more gregarious and outgoing than me, it was fun. It was an adventure for them. But for me, I was a shy, kind of insecure kid. And so it was it was difficult. Like it was really difficult for me because I'd go to a new school and I just struggled to make new friends and, and I was fairly introverted and shy and painfully shy. And so, you know, one of the things as I grew older is I said, I didn't want to do that with my kids, you know, right or wrong. And, and I had a, an amazing childhood, don't get me wrong. Um, but it, I always struggled to make those connections. And so it, it shaped me in that family is very important to me. I'm very, very close with my family. Um, and it really bugged my mom that I didn't have a lot of friends at the time. So I spent a lot of time, she stayed at home and raised us. So, you know, I, she still talks to me this day as she misses me sitting on the kitchen counter and just talking to her. Um, but, but I look at, you know, the adult that I've grown up to and what I do for a living now. It was kind of a blessing because I, I got to develop my mind when I was younger. I spent a lot of time with myself. I got to read. I got to spend time in nature, uh, and which made me very curious about the world and how it worked. And I, and I carry that curiosity through to what I do today as an adult. But also, like, I'm okay being contrarian today. And I think that's a real advantage mm -hmm. to what we do for a living. Because as value investors, we're looking at things in a different way, and we're, we're trying to go against the, the herd, which is kind of, you know, we're social creatures as humans. We're kind of wired to do what others are doing. Um, but that, that little bit of contrarianism in me today, I think, comes from my childhood. So, you know, to this day, I'm, I still love puzzles. I love being outside. I have a very small circle of friends. And I'm totally content just sitting in a room reading an annual report. And I think that's all comes from my childhood. You know, another thing I think about is in my childhood. So my parents always instilled the right values in, in my siblings and I and, and made sure that, you know, we were ethical and hardworking and we were, we were all going to go to university. That was never even a doubt in my mind. And I think I came out of the womb as a capitalist because I always remember as a kid, delivering newspapers or shoveling snow or cutting grass. And, and I just love money. I had this fascination with money. And I don't, I, I've tried to think uh -huh. about it, and I don't know why. I still have it to this day. I just like making it, collecting it, and, 
you know, as I've gotten older, now it's stocks. I just love collecting stocks. And it's even, to me, it's not even what you can do with money. It's just for the sake of amassing it. And it just gives you the freedom to do whatever you want to do. So, um, you know, the, those are the things that I think shape me. Um, as a kid, my dad was always fascinated by the stock market. And so I always had that bug in there somewhere. But in terms of career path, you know, I always thought I was going to be my dad. He was, he was my business role model. You know, I have this drawing from when I was six or seven driving a Pepsi truck because my father worked for Pepsi Cola. So I thought I was going to drive a Pepsi truck when I was, I always wanted to be my dad. And so when I went to university, um, I thought I was going to go to business school, but I, then I discovered partying and, and girls and met my wife there. So I kind of came out of my shell and had too good a time. And I didn't get into the business school that I wanted to. And my daughter, who uh, did get in a generation later, reminds me of that all the time that she got in and I didn't. So then I, I just pivoted and I went to law school. And, and I know we'll come back to it, but I just had a roundabout journey to sometimes in life, you, you can't plan it out, right? You just look at opportunities that are in front of you and you do the best that you can. And it's been an amazing journey and it's not over yet, but uh, it, it, it wasn't. There wasn't a blueprint at the very beginning, Bogomil, where I said, you know, someday I'm going to be sitting talking to you and managing a portfolio. It just, there's a lot of life situations that happen. Life's messy. It sounds obvious when you look back, isn't it? Like you can connect the dots, but looking forward, it gets a bit tricky to figure out what's the next step. I want to briefly come back to a couple of ideas that you mentioned, like being different. And it's a topic that comes up in my conversations with a lot of investors out there that giving yourself permission to be different and you moving from a school to a school to a school, by definition, the first weeks and maybe months, you were different and you got very comfortable with being different. And in investing, if you really want to stand out, I think you'll agree with me here that you have to be different. And you, you kind of train yourself to be very, very comfortable being different. And many people, don't really like that feeling. Yeah, and my my mom to this day, like I'm, I say, I tell her I'm a, I'm different. I'm a bit of a weirdo, and that's. I say, mom, I like who I am. You know, I I like that I don't necessarily have to be like everybody else, and and she's wired very differently. She's wired like my brother, very gregarious, all about people, an amazing ability to connect with people, large group of friends, and so. She, in some ways, she can't relate, and so she she kind of feels bad for me, or certainly when I was a kid. Uh, but now I embrace it. I like who I am, Mom. <laughs> you know, I'm not perfect. I have I have, I have some issues, but it's an asset as an investor. It's a total asset, especially as a value investor. Um, and you know, my dad likes to say that, Mike, you live in your head. I do live in my head, and I think many investors whether it's Buffett or Munger, they live in their head. And we have families and, and you know, we, have, we create lives for ourselves in the real world. Um, but I, I have no regrets, you know, because I knew I was loved. Ultimately, Bogomil and I look at, today I'm still very close with my mom and dad and my brother and sister. And, and um, you know, we all get along. My parents just took us on a safari to Africa, actually. We were there for 10 days and it was all, like, all the three of us and our children and our spouses. So we're all very close, and, and I think mom and dad, you should be proud of how all your kids turned out, and even if we're all a little bit different. That childhood, and it was a good childhood, but it prepared me and created who I am today, and it's helped me do what I do for a living and made me a better investor. Do you remember buying your first stock, like the actual first leap? It looks like you had a lot of business conversations around the dinner table and Investing was not a foreign territory, but was there a moment when you bought your first stock? What was it like? I remember in high school, my dad always encouraged us to invest. Um, and he was an amateur investor. He was a full-time CEO and ran businesses. So he had a mixed record, and we had a mixed record when we invested money. So I, I do remember one company we invested in, Placer Dome which is a Canadian mining company. It won't surprise you to learn that that was the first stock that I can actually remember. And it didn't turn out well, so that's part of why I remember it. But I always had that bug uh, trying to understand, 
you know, why stocks trade the way they do. I, I can remember being on vacation. I was probably in my 20s, maybe even my 30s, reading an annual report for Canada Bread. It was a, it was a bakery company. And the stock was trading on 10 times earnings. And I remember thinking, you know, why is it trading on 10? I just, I didn't understand why certain stocks traded on certain earnings multiples and others didn't. Uh, and, and so, I, again, it's like a puzzle. When I was a kid, I just liked to kind of figure it out. But I'd say Placer Dome was the first stock I kind of remember buying. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't get serious about investing as a career, or even with my own portfolio until my 30s. I'd say it was, it was probably a lot later than a lot of investors today. You know, some people wake up high school and know they want to be a doctor or you know, an investor, and I didn't. My journey was a little different, Bogomil. I think it's good to lose money on the first stock you buy. Whenever I give talks, I ask people, have you lost money on your first stock? And, and if they're honest about it and if they lost money, I think it sets you up for a different learning experience than if you get lucky the first time around. I think it can be very misleading and you might think that it's easy and we'll talk more about it, but you say that investing is hard. I am very curious about investing in mathematics. You, in your writing, you mentioned how they're both rational and objective. And I like them both for the same reason. I was drawn both to math and then investing for those reasons. But can you talk more about your experience with those two fields? Why it's so important for you to be rational and objective? Yeah, so math, I studied math in university. I was really good at it. And I don't know why, but it's just how my brain is wired. And so it often came easy to me, at least until some of the more senior calculus courses in university. There was something about it where with, with study and effort, you could become very good at it. And, and a lot of people found it hard, and I didn't. So we, we tend to gravitate to things that we're good at, whether it's athletics or academics. And so that was part of it. Part of it was, you know, I've always liked science. To me, mathematics is the, it's the language of the universe. If you look at whether you go back to Newton or Kepler, And there's something true about how the world works, how the universe works, the inherent in mathematics. And we're still trying to figure it out, you know, at the subatomic level, for sure, that we're, there, are, there are certain fundamental truths embedded in math. And I just found that fascinating. I found it fascinating that you could, I mean, at least in, in school, you could, when you're doing math, you open up the back and you figure out whether or not you're right or not. Um, and so with, with effort, there's actually a solution. It's not gray. It's black and white, and, and you can get there. And so that appealed to me. And, and, you know, it's just that combination of being good at it with work and effort and the fact that it was a rational pursuit, and there's something true about it, if that makes sense. When I look at investing, so at, at its core, investing uses a lot of math. You know, ultimately, the, the, the value of any asset is the discounted cash flow of, that you can take out of that asset over its useful life. So fundamentally, there's a correlation there, and we use a lot of math, and it helps us as investors. But that's the easy part. The hard part about investing is everything else. Just the world is so messy that, you know, humans get involved, and irrational behavior or COVID happens or wars happen. So it's, it's really, really hard. And you're mixing those too. So part of it is still pretty easy for me, but the, the hard part is it's a probability game. You know, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, Donald Trump was almost assassinated not that long ago. And, um, you know, Joe Biden was the nominee and now it's different. So, so a lot of different things can happen. And so it's math is there at its core. But just because you're good at math doesn't mean you're going to be a good investor. I think it's learning about psychology, and you got to bring in so many different disciplines. You know, one of the things I love about this game that we play, Bogomil, is you and I go to this conference, guys' conference every year at ValueX. We're all trained by the same people, by Buffett and Munger, and we're all trained by Benjamin Graham as value investors. You and I can look at the same stock and come to a completely different conclusion. And we're both really rational people. But that's what I love about it is there's something unique about my life experience and my judgment that's going to be slightly different than yours, and it's going to take me to a different place. 
And so, you know, I just, I love the game, but at its core, I'm still the math geek. I was in, in high school. I just love solving, solving puzzles. And to me, investing is just a big puzzle. You're trying to figure out what a company's worth, how that company is going to continue to evolve, how capitalism is going to work to try and destroy that good business. And it's, it's, all, it's all those different factors that make it so difficult and so fun at the same time. I can relate to that on so many levels. I like numbers and math. I like history and people too. But when I would write an essay, I would hand it in and I had n no idea what grade I will get, even if it was properly written and everything was fine. You know, I always felt that it's, it's very subjective and it would be like a, you know, a B minus or a B. And, and because I didn't capture the essence or I didn't really, you know, follow what was expected. Then in math, if the answer was four, the answer was four. Right. Like that's right. it. That's the end of the conversation. It could happen now and then that the teacher would tell me, could you show all six steps how you got there? Because I would get there in two steps. And she knew that I didn't copy it from, from anybody, but she wanted me to show all six steps. And for me, it was a waste of time. Like, why would I show all head. six steps if I can get there in yeah. two steps? Right, exactly. So, and the market, I was drawn into the investing. And Peter Lynch, One Up on Wall Street, was the first book that I read because I thought that the market really doesn't care who you are, how old you are, what's your gender, anything about you. The market doesn't care. If you did the work and if you're more right than wrong, you'll be just fine. It's an intellectual pursuit that you can do from wherever you are. And you can really compete with institutional investors out there that have all the resources because you have the, the freedom to do it the way you like it. And actually, in a way, I became an institutional investor, but I, I want to remain as much of an independent thinker within an institutional setting as I want, as I can. But the market was this place where I thought it's objective in the sense that if you play it long enough, the game that you want to play, I call it the infinite game, the kind of money I manage for families long-term patient capital. We're compounding wealth over time. We're not trying to win a short-term race. And in that kind of a race, I, I think I have a chance to do just fine if I don't do anything silly on the way. So that's what drew me to it, and I can relate to what you're sharing. But there's a lot of emotion and psychology in it. But as disciplined investors, I think we can take advantage of it. When the world goes crazy, we have a chance to buy something at you know, half off which wouldn't be available in many other circumstances. So I think, I think that's the fascinating part. I want to ask you about the career path a little bit more. And, and I asked you that you know, privately before, but I'd love to hear the full story. So Charlie Munger was a lawyer, and I, I met a lot of lawyers who became investors. So I'm always intrigued about this moment of <laughs> discovery that this is the field that you really want to be in. But I feel like being a lawyer, and I have a lot of respect for the profession, molds you, shapes you in a certain way that's actually very helpful. It's very logical. You know, there are some rules and so on and so on. But there's a human aspect to it too, I think. Can you talk about this uh, journey from one side of the universe to the other side of the universe, what it's been like for you? Sure. Yeah, so university, I studied math, as I said. Um, didn't go to business school. I pivoted and I knew I didn't want to be a math teacher because I like money too much. And so my roommate from first year university, Joe, uh, hi, Joe. I said, what are you going to do? And he said, oh, I'm going to go to law school. And I said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So I literally, last minute, I crammed for the LSAT. I got on a bus uh, to go write it. And unfortunately, I got in and ended up doing a joint law business degree. I ended up getting into business school eventually. But so I fell into law school. Well, I mean, it wasn't this grand plan. But when I became a lawyer, I articled and I, I practiced for almost seven years, became a partner at a law firm in Toronto. It, it taught me a lot of skill. It teaches you how the world works. Like even in first year law school, you learn about property law. You learn about contracts and how that work. You learn about securities law and the rules that, that govern the capital markets. And so those, those are fundamental things about how the world really works. And even different countries have different laws and different ways of working. So it kind of opened my eyes to a lot of the things you just, when you grow up, you don't even think about you know, contract and property rights. It taught me how to write. When I look back at my university days, I, I still have this essay I wrote in, I think it was an astronomy class on the planet Jupiter, and it was, it was horrific how bad the writing is. But when you're a lawyer, 
how you write, words matter. And so you learn to become very specific about how you articulate things. And so that those skills are invaluable. You know, even if you decide not to practice law or go into investing, learning how to write, learning how to communicate are important skills. And so that kind of prepared me for, for you know, the next leg up or, or next um, step on my journey. But also, you know, more practical day to day. We read annual reports and proxy statements. I used to draft those things. So, so part of when I read an annual report or a 10K, I know what's boilerplate. I know what the lawyers wrote and I know what management wrote. So it just helps me to really filter very quickly what matters and what doesn't matter as much. Um, and so all of those things, I use them every day. When there's a takeover bid in the market or someone's accumulating shares or there's a proxy battle or, you know, a host or a um, activist shareholder, I know what the rules are. And so I can, I can understand what the motivations are. I can understand the framework. And so that comes in handy from time to time when, when we're looking at a situation. But, you know, all that prepared me for, after seven years, I knew I didn't want to practice law anymore. And I had an opportunity to join a group of people in our, we were all in our thirties who bought out Eric Sprott, owned a, an investment bank in Toronto. So that was my pivot to the investing side. I always knew that I wanted to go into business somehow. I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to go into the stock market or things related to the stock market, but I just, I had that one opportunity and I saw it and it appealed to me. And so I jumped and um, from law, I was an investment banker for about nine years with a, a company in Canada. Um, it was called Sprott Securities at the time. We, we changed the name to Cormark. And, um, you know, that's where I really learned about capital markets and how they work. I learned a lot about um, how stocks are valued. And I was fortunate, again, just another lucky moment in my life. Uh, one of my research analysts, I covered financial services. And one of my colleagues, Jason, was a real Buffett nut. And so I remember being in his office one day talking about a company and I, I looked on his shelf and he had the old shareholder letters from like the 1970s on in binders. He used uh -huh. to print them. They didn't have them in a booklet at those days. And so I said, do you mind if I borrow it, Jason? And he said, no, go ahead. And like, he always used to talk about Buffett and I knew who Buffett was, but I didn't really know what he did and how he did it. And for me, once I read the letters or started reading, like a light went on. And then that took me to the intelligent investor. And then I've just, I've never stopped, but it was so rational. Maybe that's the mathematician in me that it just made so much sense. Um, that that's kind of how I found investing. And, you know, over those nine years, I learned a lot about how to value a business, how markets work, what a research analyst really means when they write market perform or hold. And just, you get a, a big cross section of different portfolio managers so you can see how they operate. And as an investment banker, you're you're kind of on the other side. You're listening to your capital markets desk, but you're dealing with CEOs and CFOs and boards and you're seeing what really goes on behind the scenes and, and what's motivating them to do certain things. And so, you know, it was fascinating to me. It was just, again, it was just my, my education's never stopped since university. I just kept learning. And then after 15 years on Bay Street, which is Canada's smaller version of Wall Street, um, you know, I'd had enough. It's a young person's business. And uh, I probably should have been a research analyst rather than a, an investment banker because, you know, for the kids out there today that want to go into investment banking, it teaches you how to value a business. You do get a lot of practical skills, but, but ultimately, as you get more senior, it's a sales job. Right, you're trying to convince CEOs and boards that you're better than your competitor, and I mean the reality is most of us can do the job some better than others. But I, but I'm still that math geek sitting in the corner reading an annual report. So uh, I think I think portfolio management or research analyst is more suited to my personality. And so it took me a while, Bogomil, but I finally found what I think is the job that's best suited to my particular temperament. Hearing it, it sounds like you had those big building blocks between being a lawyer, then an investment banker, and then finding your way all the way to managing money for other people and being a portfolio manager. It's quite a journey, but you learned a lot in all those experiences, and all of that became really, really handy 
in in this environment. And I love the aspect of writing. I feel like it's a very underrated skill. I think people talk about it more. But that's how we communicate, and that's how we organize our thoughts, and that's how we can go back and reanalyze an investment case from five years ago. I mean, it's it's very, very helpful to keep a record of what you're thinking at any given point in time. For me, it's been a great learning experience to go back and reread and be honest of what I thought at the time, because we have a bit of a hindsight bias in the sense that we rewrite what we thought at the time. Of course, we knew that uh, COVID will lead to a big bull market. We didn't. You know, in March of 2020, <laughs> I, you thought the world I was took ending. too many calls from very, very smart people to know that nobody really knew where this is going. So I just thought, you know, how bad can it get? And given the portfolio that I, I was managing at the time, and, you know, in principle, it's very similar to the one I manage today, different stocks, the stocks have changed. But I knew that the balance sheets are strong. I knew that these are real businesses. And I knew that the market can knock them down another 20, 30%. But at the end of the day, I, f I thought that there is real value behind what I'm holding. So if I can wait, and I think for me, the ability to wait, it's a great privilege to be able to wait. And it depends on the kind of clients you have and the philosophy you have. Yes. But if you can wait, you can really take advantage of those moments. You, you brought up writing and you brought up Buffett. And there's a quote in one of your letters where you talk about not being good at art, but you share the story how Buffett sees his work as a, a painting, as his Sistine Chapel. And that's how you think of your work. Can you talk about that, that visual of you know, a collection of stocks being your piece of art in your mind? Yeah, so I have a niece who's in her teens, and she's an amazing artist. She really is. Like She paints and draws things that I could never do. I don't have that gene. I can remember being in grade eight and we had this art class and people around me were doing portraits and Scott right beside me painted this amazing picture of waves in, in uh, acrylic. And I can still remember my, my painting was this alligator with a golf ball in its mouth. It was a, I was a golf nut. It looked like a child did it. <laughs> it was so, it was so bad. That's not my talent. And so when I, when I read uh -huh. about Buffett being in the Sistine Chapel, he talks about his portfolio or his painting, and he's lying on his back and he's painting, and then someone else says, you know, put a little more red in it. And he says, goodbye. It's his painting. So, you know, I can paint with, I can't paint with my hands, but I can paint with my mind. And, and so all, all of my life experience and judgment and learning, I can create a portfolio of my best ideas. And, and I'm, you know, my job is to wake up every day and continue to learn and to have new insights to try and make it better. And it's never finished, right? You can always make it better. Wake up and you see the world, you see something different and you say, oh, you know, I've changed my mind on that. Um, so it, for, for a math geek, that's my version of painting. I read Walter Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo used to paint he used to paint some of his masterpieces over decades. Like I think even the Mona Lisa, I remember as he, as he learned more about, um, he used to go study cadavers so in anatomy where he learned something about a new technique. And so sometimes, you know, a year after he was painting the Mona Lisa, he'd come back to it and just, just a couple strokes, he had this new insight. And so it just reminded me of, of my portfolio that I'm trying to build for, for our clients is I'm always trying to make it a little bit better and it's never done. And, and so that's, that's the analogy. And, and it resonated with me because, like I said, I, I can't paint for the life of me, but I can paint with my mind by virtue of the portfolio. And so that's how I think about it. There's so much in this story. One is this open-ended pursuit. The other thing is that you can only do it. The way you're doing it, you can only do it. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful realization because as investors, we all want to be like Buffett or we want to be like Munger or whoever we admire. But then we realize we put ourselves into the work and the work will look, resemble us, our experiences, our particular flavor of what we're looking for. And, and it's okay. And as you said, you know, we meet at Value X. We all follow the same philosophy and principles. And we mm -hmm. kind of understand each other without saying anything. 
But in, if you looked at our portfolios, I think they couldn't differ more from very concentrated to very diversified, from small to large, from very domestic to very international and so on and so on. So it's fascinating to see how the expression of that kind of art can be very, very different depending on the, the person. It's the unique Michael, expression ask of you our best mistakes. ideas. Sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. No, no, no. It's, it's, I like that our best ideas at the time. But they do change over time. Would you agree that uh, we change, we evolve, and uh, they will not be the same 10 or 20 years from now? Do you, do you feel that way, that you will continue to evolve as an investor? I hope so. I mean, w we get paid to learn, which is you amazing. But, but I think you get better at this business over time. I, I would argue that I'm a better investor today than I was 10 years ago or five years ago. And I hope that I'm a better investor five years from now. I mean, you get to a point where your cognitive facilities start to decline. Uh, hopefully, knock on wood, you and I are nowhere near that. So I, I, as much as I admire Buffett and Munger and try and take in all the lessons, I'm not them. Warren, I love you, but I can't do a DCF in my head like you can. And, and I'm probably, I'm obsessive, but I'm not as obsessive as he was. So I think, I think it's important as an investor just to recognize your own limits and your own strengths and weaknesses and be comfortable with that. You know, I'm not trying to be warned. I'm just trying to take his lessons and all the other lessons from different investors and marry it with my own unique experience and view of the world and, and try and produce the best product that I can. I think it's important to be honest with yourself. What is the, the game that you're actually playing? And the beauty of investing is very different than in many other pursuits where you have the number one winner and we forget who was number two. And I think Tom Gaynor, in his interview with William Green, who is also our mutual friend, brought it up how in investing, if uh, the way I understand and the way I look at it, when I'm sitting in Omaha at the Berkshire meeting, you know, in the room, there are people that probably have very little, and people that have few million dollars, and there are a few that have a few billion dollars, and then there are a few that have probably a hundred billion dollars and more. And we all, in a way, won in our respective games, <laughs> right? It's to me, you know, when I look at Munger, who had two or three billion, and, and Buffett that had at some point, I think, a hundred times as much as Munger, they both won. They're both winning their own games. It's a very pe peculiar pursuit that you don't have to be faster by a fraction of a second than the second guy behind you. It's not that kind of a game. And I think the moment you realize that it, it's your game, and if your game is to have you know 2 million at the end of the day, or 10 million, or 50 million, it's your game. And it's not that mine is better than yours or worse than yours. It's your game. If you're playing it the way you want it, have fun with it. It's your painting to play with. And nobody should tell you if you need more red in that painting or not. Do you think that Charlie Michael, Munger, there's anything that Charlie couldn't do that Warren did because Warren has an extra tens of billions of dollars. Warren's never going to spend it. He's just playing the game. No, I think what, once you mm, get to a certain point, yeah. it's just it doesn't matter anymore. Other than for no, ego, no, I think I think I think Munger had, if anything, I I read somewhere that he didn't want to be on any list, so he wanted to be financially independent, comfortable. And not on any list. Like he didn't want his name to be on the richest <laughs> well, of the world list. And I thought it was. <laughs> but if you play this game pretty well for a very long period of time, you run the risk of ending up on some sort of a list. You know, I think that's that's the. And he he lived an incredibly long life. You know, a hundred years almost. So I I think if you, that's the power of compounding. You know. I think compounding is such a fascinating phenomenon, yet I think it's so hard for our brains to understand because I think we spend so much time in the linear way of perception of the world. You know, I have two apples, you have three apples, and we have four apples. And here you have interest on interest. And it doesn't really matter that much over two, three years, but it's, it's staggering what this can do over 50 years. And the fact that Buffett, I think Morgan Housel talked about it, how Buffett made 90 95% of what he has after the age of 60, 65. It's, it's fascinating to think about it because we think of Buffett already rich, you know, at 20 and 30 and 40. 
And here you're telling me that he made the majority of it after the age of 65. How is that possible? But that's how numbers work. So compounding is it's just a fascinating phenomenon that I think it's very, very hard to, to grasp. For, I don't think for our me, minds when can I look grasp. at it, I'm always surprised when I look at no, no. When I look at some clients' accounts that have been with me for a long time, I'm, I'm fascinated with like, do you remember what the, the amount was when we started? And <laughs> just to think that it, you know, it's, it's a multiple of what it was. How did that come about? You know, because you don't see it. It's like watching a tree grow. You don't see it day to day, but you can appreciate it once you can sit in that shade and enjoy it. And you realize, oh, wow, it took 20 years, but look, it's a, it's a, it's a big tree. Let me ask you about mistakes. You have a quote from James Joyce. You say that, well, he said that mistakes are portals of discovery. And investors, in my mind, love talking about the, their wins. You know, this went up this much, this much. But we can learn a lot from mistakes. It's not comfortable talking about mistakes, but we can learn a lot from them. You have some thoughts about it, I know. Yeah, well, they're, they're way more painful, which what makes them more memorable. Mm -hmm. Um which is part of learning, right? Is just remembering past errors. But it's hard. Like, I mean, Munger talks about rubbing his nose in his mistakes. And it sounds good. And, and I try and do it, but it's, it's hard, Bogomil. Because I, I think the way we're wired psychologically, whenever something good happens to me, it's because I'm awesome and it's, it's because of my skill. Whenever something bad happens, it's because I had bad luck or someone did it to me. I think that's how we're wired. It's it's that it's our ego and our self preservation trying to think of ourselves in those positive light. I think that's the natural state of things. And you know, Munger learned this. He calls it his wonderful trick of rubbing his nose in his mistakes. So I try and work on that, and and I'm not always successful, but I I try and adopt that um, mindset. And I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, back when I was a lawyer. Uh, there was a Swiss company that I invested in, a Swiss dental company of all things, and I put $3,000 into it. And sure enough, I mean, I thought I know what it was doing, but the stock went to zero. This is back in the 1990s. And so it's still on my portfolio statement. And every year my broker, and it has an NA, <laughs> meaning that it was long ago bankrupt. My broker mm -hmm. asked me, can I take this off? And I say, no, you can't take it off because I want to constantly remind myself of how stupid I was and how you mm -hmm. know bad things can happen if you're not paying attention <laughs> in this business or you get cocky. Um, and I share that story openly with my colleagues to know that their job, especially on the portfolio side, I, <clears throat> I have a research analyst, his job is to call me out when he thinks that I'm doing something stupid. Or He, he actually did it this morning, which is brilliant. He, in his polite way, he said, <laughs> hey, you might want to look at this. And so I'm trying to create that culture here at Greenskeeper where we're going to make mistakes. I know that, but let's be open and honest about them. Let's evaluate them and let's not be afraid to admit them when, when they happen and, and just try and learn from them. And that's the only way I think you progress in this business or in life. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm not always successful. Even, you know, I look at back a couple of years ago, Meta, Facebook changed the same to Meta and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was all about the, the metaverse and we we own Facebook um, but I was getting nervous about him talking more and more about the metaverse and and, and the way I describe it is, is he's taking 10 billion dollars a year towards the metaverse and putting it in a, a paper bag and lighting it on fire you know I don't, I don't think the metaverse is going to be what he thinks it is and so I was starting to have doubts about that investment and so was the market, and the stock price kept going lower and lower and lower. And finally, I threw in the towel, and I sold it. And I sold it at the wrong time, not at the very bottom, but pretty close. And, and so when I look, if I'm honest about fast forward two, three years, he's talked about the year of efficiency, and sure, he's gotten rid of a few people. But I still think he's a little bit reckless with capital allocation. And he's, he's using the right buzzwords, but nothing has really changed with the metaverse. He's still burning that $10 billion a year and that, that pursuit of something that I don't think is going to work out. And yet the stock has been a home run because it was so cheap. So I was right long term about the thesis, but why did I sell it? Why did I sell it when I sold it? Was it because... My thesis had changed, or was it because I just couldn't take the pain of seeing the stock declining day after day anymore? Uh -huh. 
I don't know the answer. I think it's probably a bit of both. And so, you know, I talked to my colleague about it and, and you got to be honest about that. And I think, I think I was right long term, but, but a smarter decision would have been, well, it's true. You get out when the stock is reasonably valued, but that, that decline every day probably impacted me a little bit. And that was a mistake. So all you can do is just own it, be honest about it. It cost us some performance and try and make sure that it never happens again. And part of this business is just being self-aware and also pattern recognition and, and try and just be sensitive to that in the future if I ever see a similar situation. And it could be the other way too, where you're getting too excited about us. All right. Where you got to, you know, mm -hmm. how is my emotion in this moment? And is that in fact, is that affecting my judgment about this stock or the portfolio? So, you know, I think you can learn way more from your mistakes than your, your victories. And most of us don't like to talk about them. I, no, I, I, I love the sound of it. I, I keep a record of stocks that I, I looked at, considered, and bought, and sold, and I, I try to keep it as detailed as possible. And I go back, and I'm curious how things worked out. And even the definition of a mistake, it's kind of a moving target, right? Because if you ask me, can you pick a stock that will be up by the end of the year? I could be wrong about it. You could say it's a mistake, but that's not how I operate. So it, how you define your mistake both on the omission and the commission side. And, and it looks like on the omission side, you know, I looked at it, I didn't buy it. That's a very tricky place to be. And I think it can lead to almost to the fear of missing out. There are so many things that I, I looked at and they've done much better than I expected. And I didn't really have the reason to believe that that would happen. And I think that's what you're alluding to. And it's, it's fascinating because I think it's a dangerous territory to use mistakes to develop this fear of missing out because there are too many ideas out there and they will do better than you ever expected for all kinds of reasons and especially over a short period of time. So it's very tricky not to use mistakes to discourage uh, you know, the pursuit, but to use mistakes in a way where you find something that I could do it differently. Somebody proposed this idea to me that they, they studied somebody's investment ideas and they would ask themselves honestly, would I have bought it? And I think it's a great question to ask you because if you appreciate that some famous investor bought it but there's no way that you would convince yourself to buy it i think it's it's just worth just letting go why torture yourself about it right so but if you find something that you know that it really met all the criteria you're looking for and you didn't buy then it makes me wonder what i could have done differently to actually include it what is it that made me maybe not buy it right like within my circle of competence and within what I would actually buy. Why didn't I buy? But yeah, I mean, you can slice it and dice it in so many ways. I know that some people even keep track of stocks that they sold and, and see how they performed and stocks they didn't buy. I think you can get to a point of almost any move uh, will trigger some sort of a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you can torture but yourself in this business. That's a, yeah, I think it's good yeah, to be introspective yeah, yeah. and it's good to, it sounds like you create some kind of a decision journal because our mind plays tricks over try, time, as you know. It's mm -hmm. hard to recreate what you were thinking at that moment in time. So I think that's a healthy exercise to look and see what you did or didn't do at the time. Um, but you can't kill yourself over it. You know, like I think Munger said, one of the last things he wrote, he says, if you look back at Berkshire and all their decisions, there were probably only a dozen of them that really mattered and moved the needle. So you don't need a lot of them. If you don't have disasters and you just have those few that are just outsized winners and you bet accordingly, you don't need a lot of really brilliant ideas over an investing career to do phenomenally well. You just got to avoid stupidity, be really, really patient, and pick those great ideas within your circle of competence and they're and we're all unique so you know mm -hmm. don't be don't be too hard on yourself because we we all make the mistakes and buffett made plenty of his over his career and i'm sure he's still going to make more that's that's the spirit and as long as the mistakes are not too big that's that's all right that's all right i want to ask you about investing along with your clients which is very important to you but before i ask i don't want to forget you brought up this one idea that went to zero and one of the, the principles that I develop over the years is it's an aspiration. I want to avoid zeros for many reasons. But if I look at an investment 
you know, I'm excited about the upside, but if I can imagine this idea going to zero in any way, I don't want to have it. And it, it can be too much leverage, usually questionable management. And these days I call it the secular decline part, where as a value investor, you might be very tempted to buy something because it's cheap, but the industry or the business is shrinking. Yes. It's an aspiration, but I don't want to have zeros in the portfolio. I feel like they, they can really cause a lot of trouble. And you know, I, I hope I don't get to see many of them, but I, I'd love not to have them. The reason I bring it up, because it's very tempting, and I've seen people make investments in ideas that could be potential zeros, because the upside is so promising. But the trick is that at some point in time, a lot of those potential zeros could be zeros at the same time. Like that's how the market seems to work. So if you have a lot of companies that use a lot of leverage to, to do, I don't know, massive expansion and, and buybacks and dividends, they're very aggressive. When things are not going well, or if there are any jitters in the market, they all seem to be experiencing pain at the same time. But anyways, my thought about my aspiration in the second half of my career is not to have any zeros. In, and I haven't had too many that I can think of. And it's been my aspiration to, if I, if I can see it as a zero, let's move on. Like that's, that's my easy test here. I share your aspiration and I, I, I'm averse to leverage companies that use them, even my personal life. And maybe that's a function of our upbringing. Bogomil, I, you know, I love the podcast uh, you did with Matthew Stafford, where you talked about your upbringing and talking to your grandfather. And, and I think my mom grew up poor. So she always instilled with me a healthy fear of debt. Uh, and I'm okay not getting rich tomorrow. You know, we, I talked with one of my colleagues about NVIDIA recently. I said, if it's up another 10%, do you want to own it? He said, no, I'm good. You know, we don't have that FOMO virus at Greenskeeper. We're both wired a certain way that that's okay. I don't have to do all these crazy things because I'm missing out. I just want to continually compound my capital prudently. I don't want it to go to zero. And if I miss up a little bit on the upside, I, I don't know about you, but I sleep pretty well at night. And I think that's a good way to live your life. I, th I think it's the best test. If you're looking at your portfolio or any individual idea, and if it doesn't allow you to sleep well at night, think about it again. And it's, it's fascinating. You might have you know, 30, 50 stocks, and you have one stock that will keep you up at night. And that's enough. <laughs> you probably shouldn't have it in the portfolio. I, I wouldn't have it, but that's, that's how I think about it. I would describe it as I'm, I'm not in a rush. I feel like if I'm doing the right thing, if I'm directionally right, I will get where I'm going and I'm not in a rush. And I had another fireside chat with Christian Billinger, who manages his family money out of London. And he said, you know, it's fascinating that I'm 43. I've been in the business 20 years, but he said, when you were younger, weren't you in a rush to, to get rich quickly? And I was never in a rush. Like, I always felt that it will come about. Like, if, if I do the right thing over a long period of time, I was never trying to cut corners and, and speed it up with, a, you know, a lesser stock or a penny stock or this or that. I, I never really had that rush. I might have owned a stock here and there that looked like a, a bit of a gamble in the early years, but I realized it's such a distraction to the process itself that it's better not to have it. Yeah, it's it's just what's what's the approach that really works for you, and, and that's been my my focus. Not in a rush. I think it's so your it's temperament is an edge, in my opinion, as a value investor. We go we go to Omaha. The majority of not the majority, a lot of the questions to Warren and Charlie over the years have been. How do I get rich like you only quicker? So I'm, I'm wired more yes. like you where I, I was never in a rush. And I knew that ultimately we would have enough to eat and, and we would be financially sound. I was more worried about the downside than the upside. Uh, maybe that's a lawyer training in me too. <laughs> Nobody, very few people want to approach the game of investing that way. And I, I've seen it over and over again where they want to use leverage and, um, it usually ends badly where, you know, Buffett and Munger tell you how to do it. They give you the roadmap. They're an open book about how they did it. And yet only, I think, something like 5% of the world's investors are value investors. And why is that? It's not intelligence. To me, it's temperament. I don't think enough people have the patience to put in the work, to not have to be trading all the time, to have the discipline, to just you know, put in the grind year after year after year, and then just watch that long tail at the very end compound. 
and it'll it'll happen inevitably if you do it right. Um, but I don't Very much I think so. everybody wants the hack, right? How do I get there today? And mm-hmm. for those that can put in the work and, and get there the proper way, more prudently, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a less stressful journey, in my opinion. And usually, I think you're going to have a much higher rate of success. It's just going to take time. I don't know. I share your view of the world. You reminded me of one of the early conversations I had with um, one of the partners of the firm where I worked years ago. And I remember sitting down with him, and I was this uh, graduate from, you know, I had my finance degree, and I, was, I read all the books I could find at the time, Buffett and, and Peter Lynch and everybody else. And I remember that conversation vividly, and I don't know why I led the conversation in that direction, but I wanted to know what he has done to avoid losing money. And Enron was on the minds of a lot of people at the time, and we talked about Enron at the time, which was a total you know, fraud and bust, and, and a few other ideas. And I asked about the internet stocks, how did his firm navigate that time and avoided the, high, you know, the highest flying stocks of the day? And I remember that ninety percent of my questions were about how, what, ev- tell me everything I have to know not to lose money, because I feel like the money making part, <laughs> I can figure it out. But what can I do not to lose money? And and I think I made an impression on him because he ended up hiring me. And I <laughs> I thought back like, how did I know at the age of you know twenty four, twenty five to ask those questions? But somehow deeply ingrained in me was this idea: of, tell me first how I can go wrong about it. And I'll figure out the, the right side of it. And it just stayed with me. And I still say that I want to be the least wrong. Like a lot of people come to invest in me because they want to be yeah. right. And they want to prove yeah. everybody wrong. I think about it. I, I don't know what the world is doing. I don't know what anybody else is thinking. If I was by myself in the room making decisions, what can I do to be the least wrong about what's about to happen? Because I'll never know what the interest rates will look like, what the consumer demand will look like. I can read as much as anybody else, but I will still not know, especially anything that's near term. So what can I know about investing? And it's all really long term. I can make some long term decisions here that directionally feel right. Maybe as you're talking, you know, I was thinking about maybe you and I got more than our fair share of loss aversion as human beings in our youth. And I think that's an edge as a value investor is, is trying to protect that downside. I think Seth Klarman, who's more a deep value investor, has always said, you know, if I, if I, I think he takes that approach where he tries to look at ways to kill an investment and how can it go really wrong. And he says, if, if all of those possibilities I figured aren't, aren't going to happen, then it's usually going to work out pretty well. So I think a certain segment of value investors start with that loss aversion. I share that approach, but again, I don't think it's, maybe it's innate. I don't, I don't know the answer. But it's, it's very helpful once you figure that side out. I'm very I optimistic, and I think the, the, the future is, is, I mean, I think there are incredible businesses coming our way that will be listed in our lifetime that I'm really excited to own, and I can't even think of them, but I've seen so much change and improvement in the last you know, 20-some years that I'm, I'm very excited about it. But at the same time, I do want to avoid the worst of trouble. Michael, I want to ask you about the client side. And uh, I know that you invest along your clients, and I'm curious to hear about it. I feel the same way. I don't see any other way of doing it, but I think it's very important to bring it up. And then I want to talk about the longevity. It looks like both your holdings and your client base, the, the quality that I would describe as, as longevity, they are here with you for the long run, and the investments you make are here with you for the long run. Can you talk about those two aspects, investing along? your clients and thinking of the longevity of the experience. Yeah, sure. So when I started the firm 12 and a half years ago, I mean, it was really just my own money and my mom and dad gave me a little bit, my brother and sister. And it's, I can assure you, it's, it's a lot easier to lose your own money than it is for family or friends. I mean, you take it really, really serious when <laughs> people you love and care about have entrusted you with their capital. And so I just created the firm as a vehicle for others that wanted to invest alongside the way I was going to manage my own money. Uh, And so I'm, again, to this day, I'm fully invested. I own the same stocks as our clients, and it's most of my net worth. Um, 
And so, and so when you do that, I think you want to make sure you take it really seriously. I'm careful. Uh, I'm deliberate. And I want to attract people that want to come to the firm that share our philosophy. Because when you, when you have a client leave, you know, that's rejection and it stings. It still stings. And so I want to try and avoid that situation. And I just want to make sure that the people that come to Greenskeeper, much like Buffett did with Berkshire, are a good fit. You want to have the right kind of shareholder or client in our situation. So, you know, over 12 and a half years, I think I've lost maybe eight clients. You know, one passed away. One was due to a divorce and she's probably coming back. And so I think we've done a really good job of just attracting people that share our philosophy. And, and when I'm doing a first meeting with a client or interview, I want to make sure, I mean, they're interviewing me, but at the same time, I'm interviewing them. I want to make sure that they're going to be a long-term fit. And I, you know, I say things like, if you're looking to double your money today, you know, we're, we're not for you. We're more about that long-term compounding, long-term thinking. And so I've always invested alongside our clients. And, you know, it shocks me, Bogomil, that more people in our industry don't do that because it aligns incentives. I think there, there are hedge fund managers out there that will add leverage and they're really trying to, they're trying to increase short-term returns so that they can maximize their own profitability. But if they blow up, they just close down the fund and start another one or go do something else. I think a lot of the bad behavior in our industry would be solved if people were forced to eat their own cooking and, and had all of their money alongside their investors. It's not a guarantee that things would work out well, but I think it would get a lot of, rid of a lot of the bad behavior that happens in our industry. So I've, I've always embraced that philosophy. Our employees, I've never forced them or put any kind of pressure on them at all to invest in the firm or in our portfolios. And yet, you know, our full-time employees are all fully invested with their entire portfolios on their own. And that just tells me they've had an inside look at what we do. They believe in our mission. And so that, you know, brings a smile to my face. And uh, every time they add to it, I give them the speech that, look, if you want to diversify and own the, the S&P 500, I'm okay with that. I'm not going to be angry. It's not going to change your career path at Greenskeeper if you want to diversify. But um, we believe in what we're doing here. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it seems to have resonated. We started with $3 million in assets under management, and we, we just keep snowballing. And, and it's accelerated over the last year. I don't know why, but it has. And even with portfolio positions, we, tend to, we do tend to hold them for a long period of time. Because you don't get great opportunities that often. In my experience as a value investor, the hardest part is just being, I can tell you what the great businesses are. We know what they are. It's finding an opportunity to buy them at an attractive price. Because if we know about them, most likely everybody else does too. Um, so our portfolio turnover has been very low. Last year it was zero. Historically, it's been about 17%. So we, we hold stocks for over five years on average. And so I deferred capital gains. We don't pay a lot of uh, trading commissions. And, and most importantly, I'd say, is we get to allow time uh, to do its thing. And th many of them are compounders. So you just watch them accrue in value over the years and you get to know them better. So, you, so we become better as investors at evaluating the business over time. And it just suits my personality. I mean, I see people that run funds that are short-term trading and flipping all over the place. I, I don't know how they do it. Like it would, it would stress me out. I would rather make very deliberate decisions and bets. And, you know, unlike mathematics where, you know, you can turn the page and see, are you right in our business? Sometimes you're going to look stupid <laughs> for years at a time. And yet you, you're still right, but you're only proven right years later. And so I, I like that game, but that's the way I think about the portfolio. And I think of our clients as partners that are kind of along for the ride with, with me and my wife and our, our family's money. I love the sound of that. And, and the word that comes to mind is alignment, right? If you're aligned with your clients, you're invested along with your clients. And as I said, I don't see any other way. And second thing is you brought it up, and I think it's very important that 
the clients pick you, but you also pick your clients. And I think that comes with time, the appreciation of the importance of a relationship that you're building. And the clients I've worked with, I've known for many years, and the ones I'm getting to know, I, I see them as potential very long-term relationships. So I do give them time to get to know me, but I do ask for time to get to know them so that we ask each other all the right questions before we get going, because I think it can save a lot of time down the road if, if it's the right fit or if it's not the right fit. And there are a thousand ways to invest money. And if somebody's looking for something very specific, I'm sure there's somebody that will say more yes than no to that. And it might not be me, and that's okay. And I think that it takes some time to appreciate that, how important it is. And you know, in, investing is kind of it feels like coasting at times because you're holding on to what you bought five years ago, and there are moments of true distress, and that's when you test your relationship with your clients. Like I remember March 2020, I would take some calls from clients, and and I realized how much I appreciate that they know exactly what I would be doing in a time like this, and that's something that you earn that kind of trust over time. And these are the moments where you can make a big difference, when you can go out and buy things. You know, I, was, I was buying a lot of stocks at the time. They were down at 5, 10, 20 year low. I didn't know how low they will go, but I, f I knew what I'm buying. I've known those businesses for a long time. And it brings me back to what you said. You know, We all know what the quality, durable, great businesses are, which are the labels that we hear very often these days. But finding the opportunity to buy them, that's a whole different story. And then having the, the audacity to hold on to them over a long period of time, that's really hard. I would ask uh, in a room when I was in, in big investment committee meetings years ago, why now? You know, people would bring a stock to the table. We would be talking about it for an hour and, and nobody would ask why now? And it would be stock that was you know, publicly traded for 12 years, 15 years, 20 years. And I would say, why, why are we talking about it now? We all know that they have the number one share, number one this. Why are we talking about it now? And having a very specific way of thinking about it. I like to buy them when they're down cheap and out of favor. It's my mantra. Like I, I, I want to see them when they're off their highs. I never bought a stock at an all-time high. Maybe one day. It hasn't happened yet. I want to see <laughs> the <doubt>. valuation. <laughs> I want to see the valuation come down. And, and I, I want to have a bit of a negative sentiment around it. You know, some downgrades. People are getting spooky, spooked by what's going on. Things are getting spooky. And then you notice that a lot of that is all about very short-term issues, you know, near-term earnings, you know, the next quarter or two will be not so good or whatever it is that brings the stock down, sometimes 30, 40%. If you find a stock that you like, I highly recommend that people look up the price range in the last year, two, three, five. I think people are so surprised that a business that they think is so great and so well-known sometimes might have traded in a range between, you know, 20 and $80 in the last two, three years. Why not buy it closer to 20? Why chase it at 80? You know, that's my mindset. And, and sometimes I'm going to miss out on some opportunities, but it, it has well, worked well for me because I want to be the least wrong. I, I want to ask you about the importance of community. And you and I appreciate greatly ValueX experience. It's, it's a number of investors coming from all, all places in the world with similar principles, similar philosophy, but very different way of expressing it. And you and I spoke about it on the snowshoeing expedition, how you know, we would be just fine sitting by ourselves in the room, but community plays a role. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So um, when I went to the first Value X, I don't know when it was, maybe 10 years ago, I was dragged there by a friend of mine. Hi, Dan. He said, you should come to this. And again, I'm a bit of a hermit. So I, I'm like, why do I want to go halfway around the world to meet other people? You know, it's a scary thought. I don't really like cocktail parties. But he dragged me out, and I, I remember vividly Guy Spear welcoming everybody and saying, welcome to the land of misfit toys. And I was like, oh, maybe these are my kind of people. And so, you know, as, a, as an introverted guy, I don't walk into a room and get to know everybody immediately. So I came back the first year and my wife said, you know, did you like it? And I'm like, I didn't hate it. I think I actually maybe liked it. And, and so I went back again and it's awesome. So again, it reminds me a little bit of my childhood where it was difficult for me to make connections with people, but it gets better every year because I've spent the time with them. I've gotten to know them. I trust them. Guys created this amazing community where if we can help one another, we will. Looking for nothing in return. These are givers. These are givers in life. And they're smart people and they're good people. And so 
we share investment ideas with each other offline outside of the conference now. And I, I would feel comfortable reaching out to almost anyone in that community if I could be helpful or if I needed help. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're all trying to get to the same place and it's amazing how generous everybody is. And that's just a function of the environment he's created and, and guys set the tone. You know, I, my analyst a couple of days ago was reading a write up by, by one of the ValueX members and uh, in the report, uh, he said, you know, we couldn't find this piece of data. And I said, if we have it, let's send it to him. And I, I think that's what's amazing about the community is just that's not the way a lot of the world works. And so that community has been very, very helpful to, for me to pick up the phone and talk to someone and bounce an idea off them. Um, and so we do try and help each other. And it's an, it's an amazing community. And I'm going to keep going until they kick me out. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to another snowshoe hike with you there next year. I'll be there. I think you summarized this beautifully, what Guy Spear created. It's this very safe setting where we can come and sit down and talk, and there's no real agenda. Like in New York, I would run into different lunches and meetings, and I would always ask who was buying that lunch because there was always something for sale, you know, a new product, a new fund, a new this, a new that. And here, we're just here to talk and just here to share, and I think Guy has created this space where we feel comfortable talking about investing in life of an investor, which is uh, something that's you know, not talked about enough, but how do we manage? And it's not an easy pursuit. It's a hard pursuit. And there are moments of you know, doubts. We talked about mistakes and FOMO and all kinds of things. But just to sit down with people that are going through the same thing, and they're not here to judge you, but they're here to help and uh, share their experience. And some, some incredible conversations happen throughout those few days. And I feel like it's only a few days, but I feel like I have memories of for a year to come, like when I go back and I want to continue some of those conversations. And this podcast has been a great excuse to bring some of the fellow value Xers to chat a little bit more and continue the conversations that we started in Clusters. So it's been really fun, including this one. Before I let you go, I have one more question I have to ask. How do you think about success? What's your definition of success? It's very personal. It, you know, if I grew up in some impoverished country, then maybe being able to feed my family would be a, a definition of success. And, and I look back at my grandparents. So on my mom's side, they were, they were farmers in Italy, and they left Italy after the war because there were, there were no jobs. You know, they had to drag their family to, including my mom, to South America. They, they, she lived in Buenos Aires for the first nine years of her life in poverty. She and her sister didn't even live at home. They lived in some convent with the nuns because my grandparents had to work and couldn't really do both. And so success for them, I think, was just coming to Canada and giving their family, the next generation, an opportunity and the opportunities that they didn't have. So for me, success is, you know, I, I had the opportunity to go to university because of the sacrifices of my grandparents on both sides and the sacrifices of my parents. So, so I think success to me is making the most of the opportunities that I've been given. Success will be trying to make my clients rich, trying to make my employees rich over time, uh, being a good husband, being a good brother and sister and a good father. Uh, and I, you know, I try, but I have shortcomings like we all do. I think it's just maximizing your potential, Bogomil, and having having the freedom to live your life the way you want to live it. And we're all different in terms of what we want to do. But um, I wake up in the morning, I get to do what I want to do. You know, and if I decide I want to do something different, I'm going to do something different. I don't. This is what I want to do. But I have the freedom to not worry about waking up and paying the rent. And my kids have turned out well. You know, some, some of my biggest accomplishments in life have been nothing to do with finance or investing. I had a daughter who has special needs, and when she was in her teens, she went through a heck of a time. Well, my wife and I helped her get through that, and it was, it was a painful time in her life, but that's probably one of the things that I'm most proud of. So, you know, it's for posterity and my children to judge whether or not I've had success. But I like my life, and I'm happy, and I'm content doing what I'm doing and learning, and 
I think having enough money to do what you want to do and the freedom living in a, a country like Canada or the U.S. or Western Europe where we can choose our own future, right? No one can, no one can force us to do something as long as we live within the, the rules of the game. So I'm, I'm blessed. Right. I'm absolutely blessed. And, you know, thanks, thanks, Nona, Nona, my grandparents and mom and dad, you know, for giving me and my brothers and sisters the opportunity to have a better life because of their sacrifices. So I think we owe it to them to try and maximize our potential. But that's, I don't know. I don't think I'm ever going to be a book writer, but that's, to me, that's, that's my definition of success. I love it. And I can tell that you're having fun and you found something that you really love and it's very important. And it made me think of William Green and his book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. And I love the title because it kind of, really sets up the framework, right? We might be attracted to investing because it's a certain path to financial independence, but when, then we get wiser in the process because we teach ourselves to, 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 to learn. You know, the, the investing is an opportunity to continue to learn, and through that, we not only get wiser, but maybe we find a way to be happy because of the, the pursuit itself. So I love the title, and I think it's such a rich book, and I think it summarizes very well. You know, if you think about it, I think about it, how the pursuit itself... It's a itself, wonderful book. Can lead it, isn't it? And William Green is, is, is such an incredible person. I love his podcast, and anytime I have a chance to see him in person, I'm I'm delighted to chat with him. And yeah, I think at the end of the day, what's the end at the end of your rainbow? And you realize that money helps, getting wiser helps, but then there's something kind of elusive that will sneak up on you as you're having fun. It's been really fun spending this hour with you. I'm so grateful we got to do it, and I'm looking forward to the next snowshoeing expedition in clusters and more topics <laughs> soon enough i appreciate the opportunity and i was flattered that you asked me so thank you bogomil and thank you for doing this and putting putting this out there my pleasure you were listening to talking billions we talk about big ideas big inspirations big topics we take on the hardest subject of all money but our conversations lead us to an even bigger question what it means to live a rich life beyond money if you enjoyed the show please take a moment and follow subscribe rate and share with friends and family we rely on word of mouth to promote the show one click for you means the world to us Thank you. Until next time, your host, Bogomil Baranowski.